All right, so when we looked at the uh, potential energy diagrams for uh, a couple of reactions, both the exothermic and endothermic reaction, uh, we saw that there's going to be a point in time uh, between the reactants and products during the reaction progression where the transition state is going to reach a peak in potential energy. And for the reaction to occur, the uh, reactant molecules need to overcome that uh, activation energy or activation barrier with enough kinetic energy to do so. Uh, so uh, before we talk about where they get that kinetic energy from, we do need to talk about why there is uh, some transition state with a very high potential energy. Uh, very early on in general chemistry one, uh, we started to make the um, relationship that if a certain molecule, atom or ion, is high potential energy, that means it's very unstable, and that's why it's high potential energy. So these transition states that occur at the highest uh, potential energy uh, position during a uh, for a potential energy diagram happen to be really unstable. And it turns out that during a, a reaction, there's always going to be a transition state that is very uh, unstable, aka high potential energy for some reason. As an example, let's look at this reaction. Here we have um, an organic molecule uh, where we have a CH3 group uh, bonded uh, to a nitrogen, and then that nitrogen is triple bonded to a carbon. Now, not shown here would be the two uh, lone pairs, uh, or the lone pair of electrons on that carbon. It turns out that that uh, molecule's uh, fairly high potential energy. It's less stable than if it were to rotate that nitrogen and carbon uh, triple bond so that now carbon is the uh, central atom and nitrogen is on the end. And of course, we'll have to write the um, lone pair of electrons for that nitrogen as well. So it turns out that uh, this molecule wants to do that rearrangement. Uh, it wants to put this carbon atom in the middle of the nitrogen uh, atom on the end. And that is, of course, because uh, carbon is much more stable with four bonds. Uh, here, it only has three bonds and a lone pair. It still has the octet rule, eight valence electrons, but it would be much more stable in this configuration where it has four bonds. Also, uh, the nitrogen is much more adept at... Um, handling a lone uh, pair of electrons because it's very electronegative. So nitrogen is more stable, or this molecule is, is more stable with the lone pair of electrons on that nitrogen atom. So what happens is this uh, molecule will break the carbon-nitrogen bond and start to do this rotation. Well, when it does that, when it breaks that bond, it turns out that the nitrogen keeps the uh, two electrons that were formerly this covalent bond between carbon and nitrogen. And so now that bond is broken and these uh, two atoms, the carbon and nitrogen that are triple bonded, uh, can start to rotate. So then that carbon comes in the middle and forms a new covalent bond uh, with that uh, carbon atom that's bonded to three hydrogens. But in the meantime, before it uh, forms this molecule that's lower potential energy, more stable, it's at this transition state where there's no bond between the carbon, this uh, carbon atom, and either the carbon atom or the nitrogen atom. And so, as the nitrogen atom took away that lone pair, or that, uh, that those two electrons in that bond, and that are now a lone pair for that nitrogen, this carbon atom doesn't have the octet rule. It only has six valence electrons. The six valence electrons uh, that are uh, bonded to the three hydrogens, okay? Since we know that the octet rule is the um, is what uh, makes a lot of elements uh, stable, having eight valence electrons, this position where this carbon atom only has six valence electrons is very unstable, aka very high potential energy. So in between the reactant and product, even though the product is lower potential energy, more stable, this molecule has to go through this very high potential energy um, transition state. And that is what leads to these activation energies. Every single reaction is going to have a, um, a transition state that is very high potential energy for some reason or another has uh, too few valence electrons, has too many valence electrons, doesn't have the uh, right number of bonds that leads to a stable formal charge. Uh, every reaction goes through this. 
And so that is what causes the activation energy for a reaction. Now, the next thing we want to think about is where does, where would this molecule get enough kinetic energy to overcome this activation energy? And it turns out that any given temperature, a molecule could have enough kinetic energy to overcome an activation energy. And that comes from looking at the thermal energy distribution of a given uh, molecule. Okay, so the thermal energy is, of course, related to its temperature. And if you think about the temperature of a sample of some molecules, uh, we know that temperature is a measure of their uh, kinetic energy, a relative measure of their kinetic energy. Just because a, uh, but, but because, um, but if a uh, molecule is at a certain temperature or a sample of molecules is at a certain temperature, that doesn't mean that every single one of those molecules has the same kinetic energy, even though they're all at the same temperature. Temperature is really a relative measure of their kinetic energies, and molecules actually have a wide distribution of kinetic energies. That's what we call the thermal energy distribution. So if we plotted the percentage of molecules that have a certain kinetic energy, that plot actually takes what's called a Boltzmann distribution, where there's a small number of molecules that, that have... Um, low kinetic energy and some molecules that have high kinetic energy and most in the middle so the thermal energy distribution looks something like this where it slowly goes off to zero all right so this isn't and actually that's a it should tail off a little bit more than that so let me rewrite that redraw that so they go up and slowly come down. Okay, so uh, what this basically tells us is that um, at a, any given temperature, a small percentage of molecules are going to have really low kinetic energy. A small percentage of molecules are going to have high kinetic energy. And, of course, most of the molecules will have kinetic energy somewhere in the middle. All right. But uh, if you think about a activation energy needed for some kinetic energy, that's or so, for some reaction to occur, that's an actual number numerical value. It is a value that we can put on this plot. We can say that the activation energy is so many kilojoules per mole, and that would uh, um, uh, correspond to some value on this x-axis. So if that's the activation energy for a reaction, because of the thermal distribution of molecules, it turns out that at some given temperature, some percentage of molecules have enough kinetic energy to overcome the activation energy. Uh, the higher the activation energy, the further the activation energy goes this way, the smaller number of molecules um, would uh, have enough kinetic energy to overcome the activation barrier. And so that might be a slower uh, reaction rate because less molecules can overcome the activation barrier. If a reaction has a smaller activation energy and that shifts that way, that would mean more molecules might have enough kinetic energy to overcome the activation energy. And so that would lead to a faster rate, uh, you know, given all other parameters being equal. So it turns out that at a given temperature, some percentage of molecules have enough kinetic energy to overcome the activation energy. It could be a very small percentage of molecules, or it could be a bigger percentage of molecules, and that would be different for each chemical reaction.